it's either that or many or to everyone. So that's the deal. And um, uh, I'm really excited to have these speakers uh, talk about this incredibly important issue. Um, you know, we've been hearing a lot now um, still with uh, stuff around Keystone, but we don't hear too much about this, but uh, it's an incredibly important issue that we have to get out there. Um, Paul Demain is um, the Honor the Earth Board of Direct board of directors um board of director he's never mind he's oh i see he's the chair <laughs> okay oneida ojibwe former editor of the national news publication news from indian country um winona leduke is executive director honor the earth and harvard educated economist ojibwe uh, tanya obid hope i said that right a local 1850 is that right obid uh, Abid, okay, thank you. Local 1855, is that, I'm trying to, I should have gotten this straight beforehand, I'm sorry. Akin, Ak Akin. Akin. Akin, thank you. Treaty host for the Ojibwe Nation. Um, Shanai Madison is local community host, uh, living on the Mississippi and Willow Rivers. Um, welcome. Okay. Give uh, a little big hand. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna start things out here, and I'm gonna do run through a real uh, quick overview, and then we're gonna bring Winona Leduc in, who is gonna come and go. So uh, she is following this. Uh, her son has a birthday party that's going on here, and she is probably the host of her son's birthday there. So we want to keep going. So I want to say this: Buju in Dinui Maganiduk. Hello, my relatives. My name is the message carrier. I'm of the Bear Clan of the Oneida Nation. And uh, I live on the Lakutere Ojibwe Reservation uh, at this point in my life. So I want to thank you for welcoming us. And I want to kind of jump into a real quick overview and then bring Leduc in for uh, as long as she wants to just talk and then we'll go on to the other participants there and they can describe some of the sub information and hopefully uh, we can get to questions pretty quick. So I don't think we need to talk about uh, global warming or climate change. Uh, we understand that as activists, but we wanna think about how we see this, uh, how I see this uh, uh, infrastructure project in Northern Minnesota, remembering that uh, not only is there global warming and climate change and uh, horrendous impacts to the weather patterns in the United States, but we recognize that uh, the homelands of the Ojibwe Cree and Alberta, uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada have been um, uh, injured environmentally by the tar, tar sands operations there. And on the other end of some of these pipelines at Kalamazoo, uh, they've had destructive uh, spills in their history, uh, several hundred along the line. Uh, the lines that they have in the United States, something like 33 on line five uh, alone. And so we, we don't just see it as just a destructive act in Northern Minnesota or along the pipelines or in just Alberta, Canada or Michigan where, where it comes and goes, but inclusively uh, it's impacting the world in, in, in a way that uh, concerns us all and, and we wanna be proactive about how to deal with it. Right at the moment, there is at least uh, um, four or five camps operating in northern Minnesota, uh, McGeezy at the Fond du Lac Reservation, the w Water Protectors Wel Welcome Camp on the, uh, in the Mississippi, uh, the GNU Camp uh, about halfway in the middle of Minnesota. I think there's going to be a camp at Coffee Pot Landing near the White Earth Reservation, then there's one sponsored by the Red Lake Ojibwe at Thief River, in addition to numerous uh, hosting houses and lodges that have been established in the last couple of months as people have tried to figure out a way to provide uh, safe housing to people in northern Minnesota with uh, church groups and political organizations of many kinds opening their doors to host people uh, so they're safe not in this uh, pandemic and cold weather uh, but have a place uh, to go from that is locally based which is important. There are numerous court cases and issues that are now on the docket. We're waiting for uh, appeals to the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources 
resources permits, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the Minnesota Department of Commerce on the economic, or it might be PUC in Minnesota, on the economic studies analysis that were done seven years before the downturn in the tar sand industries, permits issued by the Army Corps of Engineer uh, called 404 permits for wetlands and waterways, uh, numerous uh, crossings of wetlands and waterways in northern Minnesota. And uh, the Army Corps of Engineer permits lacking an environmental impact statement. There are requests for health orders because Enbridge says that they're rushing in 5,000 workers into northern Minnesota to try to complete as much of this project in front of those appeals as they can. And it's beginning to show in terms of some of the worksite uh, safety issues. Uh, there, so we're, we're hoping to see whether or not OSHA is on top of it. They've, uh, there's been already the death of one worker at a work site. There is a horrendous crash of a pipeline truck and a logging truck uh, with people sent to the hospital. Uh, last Saturday, there was an individual who was trapped in, in the water and they're not supposed to be on lake beds and waterways that we know of, but his caterpillar sank into it and he was trapped in 48 minutes in the water until they were able to release the water from a beaver pond. So the question is whether or not we're getting the information we need about accidents and other actions on those sites that people are claiming that they're going through a job site acceleration that might be beyond what federal regulations uh, provide. And we know that there's issues over their archeological study, which were deficient. Um, in terms of the culture, historical, and certainly the spiritual aspects uh, of that area uh, that have been uh, surveyed by uh, Enbridge, but we're finding that people were chased off property and we can't find the source information for the archeological discoveries that were done. So there's a whole spectrum of stuff that's going on and that's all, all under the hub of the 1855 treaty with the Ojibwe nation in which they reserved off reservation, hunting, fishing, and other gathering rights similar to Wisconsin's case. And uh, that is what uh, many Ojibwe people are fighting for, not only uh, the fact that they feel they're being ignored in regards to the Treaty of 1855, <clears throat> but simply the potential impact to their <clears throat> resources in northern Minnesota uh, is not worth it. And so that rush to get this line in is causing uh, people to uh, rush back at Enbridge and uh, shut the lines uh, line construction down on a regular basis. Uh, there are actually numerous uh, daily reports and actions across northern Minnesota, some of them that are not making the news where job sites are being uh, shut down or workers aren't being allowed out of their work sites and so forth. So there's a lot of on the ground activity that's going on in many organizations. Stopline3.org is the major URL to go to for information, <clears throat> but Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light, 350.org, Earth Justice, 80 Feet is Enough in Wisconsin, Sierra Club and many other organizations are hosting websites where if you Google the information, you will and and ask about stop line three or stop line five, uh, you should find information about numerous organizations. There's probably 40 or 50 organizations that are now uh, cooperating in various resupply and support categories, letter writing, de-investment activities. So with that and having used up uh, about uh, 10 minutes of our time, uh, what I'd really like to do is see if uh, Winona LaDuke is on board. I saw her box come up earlier and she is waiting to be able to go online. Um, I'm here. There you go. I'm going to hand it over to you. Let me know. And if you'd like to introduce uh, Tanya after that and hand it off to her, yeah. local 1855, and then Tanya can hand it off to Shanae. Okay, go. yeah. Ani Nindoy Magadadur Kaloma relatives, Bine Sikweoma, Makwondo Dam, and I'll be happy to uh, have my sisters uh, who are over in Palisade in the eastern part of our territory. Um, talk after this, you know, I, I, I do have, it. it's my, my son's 21st birthday. Um, so I'm going to go over and give him some Indian tacos that I promise were promised. Um, having said that, look, you know, uh, we're all here. This is like an epic moment in the world. And, uh, you know, our prophecies have talked about the choice between two paths, but one being well worn and scorched, the other being green. And, um, you know, at the same time, we know that Aaron Dottie Roy talks about pandemic as portal. 
the fact is, is that the world, um, the world is changing. You know, we're doing stuff we would have never done. We're sitting here trying to figure out Zoom. I was laughing at the discussion on how to operate Zoom. We had to learn all these things. There's Skype and there's Zoom and there's all these other chat things. Oh my God, everything's changing. Disruptive technologies, that's what they call that stuff. Whole world's changing, you know? And, uh, and Exxon's not even at the top anymore. Did you notice that? It's like Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos are duking it out for who's the richest guys in the world. All this fossil fuel stuff is really last century. You know, there's climate change. There's every, you know, liability that is associated with all the blood oil and just the really inefficiencies of the system. Really amazing. Fossil fuel, uh, you know, combustion engines, like um, I think it's 16% efficient. An electric engine is 65% uh, efficient. So what kind of dummies want to hang out there with a bunch of combustion engines at the end of the fossil fuel era and act like we got a good plan. This is not a good plan. You know, the plan is we move along. We go for less, less move it around. You know, we Skype around and we Zoom around. We uh, reduce some of the stuff, we relocalize and we quit uh, having to jet everything around the world and we don't act like a bunch of addicts who need so many fossil fuels. That's what I've been thinking, you know. Some over here growing hemp, trying to do our best. My tribe's all doing solar. Everybody's going solar over here. And then we're looking at the largest tar sands pipeline in the world. I'm like, oh my God, what kind of dumb idea is that? So that's the thing. You know, here we are, last tar sands pipeline. It's like, who wants to be the last tar sands pipeline? Nobody wants to be the last tar sands pipeline at the end of the fossil fuel era, except for Governor Waltz, you know, apparently, who believes that this is a good idea because there's going to be some jobs in it. So you know, the short term is, is that we're going to battle like hell. You know, we have been up here and you've seen the videos and we are grateful to all the people of come. And my sisters are going to talk more about it because they're out there. You know, I'm on the Western front. They're in the Eastern front of line three. I'm out on the White Earth Reservation where I can just go just a little ways down the road and see the line. The line connects us all. And what we're going to do is stop the line because it's a bad idea. I forwarded to Paul, um, Domain there some data on Enbridge's line three spills. There haven't been any on this line. Why? Because they keep repairing it. And and this this is the end of the party. So you know what? We shouldn't build a new one. We should just phase the old ones out. Enbridge is perfectly capable of putting the oil that is in this pipeline. Now that they've cut back 400,000 barrels a day of oil in their throughput, because we aren't using oil, to just put it in some other lines and start chilling out and quit trying to put in more pipelines and stress out the whole Great Lakes area for some really stupid infrastructure that's really, really dangerous and puts a liability on all of these states and expects that a Canadian corporation should be supported, you know? So we're gonna keep pushing. You know, they don't have a, you know, they're acting pretty happy about getting those permits, but you know, spring is coming and resistance will be growing. You know, hanging out when it's 15 below, facing a bunch of cops, I'm, you know, my, my sisters, you know, I'll tell you that that's like not so fun, you know, but uh, the, they cannot cross the rivers. They cannot cross the rivers until it thaws. We've been praying for cold, the good Minnesota winter. We pray for cold and then we pray for snow. <laughs> and we organize, that makes sense? They cannot cross the rivers, the big crossings. There are 22 crossings. They can't take them until fall. Come join us. We'll be harvesting maple syrup. <laughs> we'll be living on our, you know, we'll be taking to canoe. Be awesome. Be outdoorsy, COVID safe. Well, I'm saying, and then just, you know, the thing is, is that we're all in this together. To get through, to get to you guys, they got to go through us. So come and help us put the cork in it over here. <laughs> I don't know what the Biden administration is going to do. We all got to push him, you know, and we just got to say it's time to move on. You know, we're all from the same ecosystem, all of us here. We're going to spend the rest of our darn lives fighting over rocks and pipes. The rest of our lives, would we spend 30 years doing it so far? 40? How about we just evolve? Time for the just transition, right? So this is our moment, people. 
This is our moment because why? This is our moment because it's a portal between the two worlds, between one world and the next. That's what Aaron Dottie Roy says. You know, it's a pandemic. You can change the world. So I say, just keep pushing, come join us. And uh, Shania and Tanya, my sisters from uh, Palisade, I'm gonna ask them to talk a little bit more specifically, but we are really grateful to everybody who's been coming out. Donations have been really good. We appreciate, we're gonna build some more tiny homes. You know, put our homeless people in tiny homes after, the, after this, this resistance. They st they're still gonna need housing, right? So let's just make housing and, and go front line. We're gonna put solar thermal panels on the houses to keep them warm, wood stoves, you know, let's make livable housing for people. It's okay. And, uh, you know, and then people are dropping off food and warm socks and all kind of things. Thank you. If, yeah, uh, thank uh, you all for help. Miigwech. Winona. If there is one thing you would suggest to a group in southern Wisconsin that they could do in the next couple of days uh, to move this agenda along, what would that be? Well, you know, there's a couple of things. One is, is that we need to push the uh, not only the president, but the senators. I mean, Wisconsin, you know, something's changed in these elections because of Indian people. You know, let's keep pushing. And uh, let's push, let's push, you know, it, at that level, there was no federal EIS done. So just to be clear, we would like a federal EIS, you know, the Biden administration could review. Um, and then you should just follow us at, at um, Honor Earth and StopLine3.org. Thanks, Winona. The date is the March 23rd is our federal court date. I probably didn't say that either. March 23rd, federal court date. That you know, office or where is that being argued? Where is that? I think it's in DC. Okay. I don't think it's here. Oh. I think it, it goes moved. It's over in DC, our federal. And it's in the same, you know, I mean, look at the decisions on DAPL. Look at this, you know, the pipelines are falling. You know, Constitution pipeline did not happen. Atlantic Coast pipeline did not happen. Single largest tar sands mine project, the tech mine, they didn't happen, you know? So just keep pushing. The tar sands are running out of dirty oil and now is the time to keep pushing. For anyone that might not be used to federal language, uh, uh, environmental impact statement is the IES, oh, which you. the federal government didn't do under the Trump administration, so. Since she's got to leave, I just wanted to give a special thanks to Winona for stopping by. Much appreciated. Zach, Zach Way's birthday? No, happy. Yeah. Honor to be with you. One team. Be the home team. That's us. Home team. Happy birthday to your son. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm going to go deliver those Indian tacos we've been working on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye then. Bye bye. Oh, Paul, I sent a thing on Enbridge's, on Enbridge's uh, spill data, but uh, um, um, Shanae and are they in this, are my sisters in the same location? Tanya, yeah. where are you? Yeah, they're, oh, ready, yes. to, they're oh, ready to take a over. I'll be back soon. I see you soon. <laughs> Good to see you here. Okay. I go with do birthday. Miigwech. <laughs> mm-hmm. Which one of you ladies would like to take off first? Or I see in uh, Tanya, they're uh, having a little bit of a dinner meal and I'm probably jealous of whatever she had because uh, with, all the, with all the donations and people showing up to cooking at the camps, she's eating a lot better than I am. I know that. Yeah. Tanya, wanna, Tanya, wanna? Sure, I'll go next. Buju, bidwe we gi ju guk we nandeja na kaz. Bakwa manoma ni kama nisa nakwang undu ndaba awasa si du dem. Ego watish kung nandeja ni gani mama. Pagngi at goni nanta jabay mo win. Forgive me, jaganashi mo win. My colonized name is Tanya Abid. Tanya, like I'll Tanya hide. Okay, um, I'm kind of a little bit under duress. Because tonight, for dinner tonight, I had some manomen. 
otherwise known as Wild Rice. And uh, earlier I had uh, fry bread and some spam, you know, that kind of thing. But you know what? Um, I feel very under duress with uh, this pipeline coming through uh, my treaty territory. And the reason why I had dinner tonight uh, uh, with Manoman, eating Manoman, is because that is one of the things that is being endangered. Um, I believe in Canada and the US, we have 28% of the wild rice in this country, in this territory. And they want to threaten that with the pipeline through it. Um, already since 1934, 15, 13 to 15 wild rice beds are already decimated. They no longer grow back. And that includes the St. Louis River. So for me, that is, this is a vital stand for me to be able to tell Enbridge, no, you get out of here. A pinhole leak is 1.28 barrels per minute. And that's a pinhole leak. And that can go up to, uh, I think it's five barrels, 1.28 barrels to five barrels a minute. And if you can picture in your mind what a barrel looks like, it's a 55 gallon barrel, and how much of that is gonna be leaking into our ecosystem here, our waters, our, uh, our, our waters that the animals depend on, the, the birds, the deer, the bears, the beavers, the fish, you know, they all have a vital part in that having that water to be healthy. So yeah, um, I'm up here over at the Welcome Water Protector Center and I've been greeting people daily. Uh, there have been new faces coming in each day. And each day I let them know what is going to happen when that pipeline breaks here. And it seems like, you know, law enforcement and DNR, they keep, keep telling me, you can't be doing this. You can't be uh, protesting. You can't be um, shutting this pipeline down. Oh, yes, I can, because they have no jurisdiction. My treaties supersede the federal government laws. Even Minnesota, Minnesota state laws, they have no jurisdiction. But you know what? Enbridge and Minnesota state did not even want to recognize us. When I went to the PUC hearings, I noticed that they didn't even have us on any of the slides that they had showing up on the TV monitors. I was like, where are we? We should be a part of that. Well, later on, as the PUC hearings were going on, they finally put us in as uh, little reservations. And then come to find out that even our reservation lands were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I was like, where did our lands go? But then they forget that we got treaty territories. And even those treaty territory boundaries, uh, they seem to be moving quite a bit over time. So for me, you know, this is really important work, you know, not only on a, a state level, but it's on a human being level. Everybody deserves fresh water, clean air, and good food to eat. You know, take a look at our bodies, for instance. We are made up of, comprised only a, a, about 90% water. You know, if we enter toxic water into that system, how are we going to behave? We're gonna have uh, medical issues, cancers, tumors, you name it, that's what we'll be having. I've had family members already, you know, um, born, without, born without brains or even that um, piece that connects the brain to halves together called the agenesis of the corpus callosum. And these folks, these um, grandbabies of mine, they lived in different parts of the state and they've been affected by the, uh, pipeline spills and also by the um, uh, logging industry, like sappy over there. Not only that, there's always this big pointing fingers between the pipeline carriers and also the mining companies trying to blame each other who is polluting the water more. So, you know, those are the things that I've been taking a look at. And then not only that, but listening to the oral histories of my family and they go further back. We, our family's been here for over 15,000 years. And people, you know, are telling me, you know, even 
even the law enforcement over here, the head cop, right? He says, you're making things up. He was telling me that his family was here longer. I was like, no way, sir. No, yours immigrated from another country. So you can't tell me that your family has been here longer than mine. So yeah, it's kind of, ooh. So anyways, you know, I, um, this is gonna come to a, like a, a, a little bit of news for um, the chairman of Honor the Earth or for the board member. On Valentine's Day, on Valentine's Day, myself and Chennai, we are going to be going on a hunger strike. We're gonna be ingesting liquids and that to be able to say that, yes, we can survive on water. I was out at the Standing Rock back in 2016, 2017. And I was there for nine months. My last month was a whole month of February. From February 1st to February 28th, I was on hunger strike there. And I survived on water. I've had medics there helping out and, you know, the whole bit, the prayers and everything worked. <coughs> so, you know, this is something that we would are, have put a lot of thought into. But then this is another nonviolent direct action stance that I'm taking and Shania is taking to be able to stop this pipeline. So I'm going to turn it over to Shania. Thank you, Shania. Um, so my name is Shania Matson, and um, I've been here at the Welcome Center since late summer, early fall. So I, uh, I grew up here in Palisade and I'm not native. My family um, came to the United States six generations ago and ended up settling right here uh, in Northern Aiken County. Um, and they came from Sweden and from Eastern Europe and most of my family members back through time, at least the men in my family have worked in extraction. So logging, mining, um, uh, other industries like that. And some of my family members now work on the Enbridge pipeline. Um, but I moved, I moved back here in part to uh, reconnect with my family and the place that I come from, um, but also because I knew I'd been following line three and before that the Sandpiper pipeline proposals because my, uh, from the beginning of those proposals, there was a plan to route uh, the pipeline across the Mississippi River close to Palisade, which is the town where I grew up. So I was living in Minneapolis, I was going to all the hearings, I was making public comments, I wrote letters to the editor, back to the hometown newspaper and elsewhere. I did all of those things like so many people did, um, thinking that the system was somehow going to work, <laughs> you know, because the overwhelmingly people were opposed to this pipeline and overwhelmingly the science. Uh, and then of course the treaty rights uh, violations that, are, uh, that the pipeline uh, creates. And so I did all of that. And then in 2018, I was at the Public Utilities Commission hearing that Tanya, uh, when she stood up and declared that, uh, that, that they had declared war on the Ojibwe people. Um, and I was part of the movement at that point and was connected with some folks, but I hadn't, I hadn't been to Standing Rock. I went for a couple of days, but I didn't have that same experience. And so I was still able to disconnect. I would go to those hearings and then I'd go back to my house in Minneapolis and I would think about you know, oh, what am I going to do when they and if they do build this pipeline through, you know, right in my hometown, if people in my family are working on this pipeline. Um, and so I started to make plans in 2018 to get myself back here. Um, and so here I am. I've been here. Um, I am here in support of and following the leadership of Tanya and Winona and other Native women who are leading, really leading this movement. Um, and, you know, I'm going to be joining uh, this hunger strike. Uh, with Tanya, um, in part to raise awareness, and it's a nonviolent direct action. Um, it's something we're doing for that reason. But also for me, um, it's really a chance to ground myself, you know, to, to, through this practice of fasting, and then being really intentionally in this place, um, as we get closer to spring, when the rivers will thaw, and when we'll be um, tapping maple trees. Um, it's just something I want to do to be able to have that uh, spiritual experience. Um, and to find out what that'll mean. Um, I'm doing a lot of work here uh, in the local community, trying to connect with folks here. And we're, you know, we're up against generations of really bad stories and a lot of violence. Um, and I'm seeing that in a new way now uh, with how law enforcement in collaboration with local government 
um, and local people who they call up, uh, you know, when they need to tell a, tell a story about water protectors to, they, they end up putting people's lives at risk by telling lies and misinformation about why we're here and what we're doing. Um, so I feel like it's a little bit of my role is in a kind of counter, <laughs> counter narrative. This is my daughter, Esley. <laughs> my kids are here with me too. Um, so I won't Mommy. go on and on um, too much about Mommy. it because I want to make sure that we have time to talk. Just a second, Esley. Right. Um, but I did want to say that, you know, my, my feeling here is that um, to be a water protector here and now really means that as settlers, you know, we are honoring those treaties, um, that those treaties were made not to grant Native people rights, but to grant us the chance to be here in a good way. Um, and I feel like I have a lot of repair work to do <laughs> on behalf of some of my ancestors and, um, and that work I choose to do by being committed to this struggle um, and being here and being present, being a witness, raising my voice, uh, raising my babies to be active um, and to honor those things. So I'll just leave it at that, but I'm really grateful to, to Paul and, and Winona and Tanya for all of your leadership and all the things you're, that I'm learning from you as I'm part of this. We are going to start the hunger strike on Valentine's Day, you know, to show love for Mother Earth. And that is the day that we are going to start. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thank this you is usually so the point where we meet in person. I tell everyone, give our speakers a big hand. So uh, you're getting a big hand right now. I'm sure we're all we're thrilled to have you guys here and hear, hear your stories. <laughs> and what's going on. So now, now it's your chance to, to ask questions of our speakers. Um, if you're interested, concerned about, you can do so by mic or by messaging. Your turn. If anyone's gonna send any chocolates, it has to be before Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right away. <laughs> Um, I, I was I just had a, a question. First, I want to say thank you so much, um, which to everyone and for the speaking and for, we'll be sending prayers for the, the hunger strikes for sure. Um, I, I watched the movie just before we started here and at the end I was con concerned and confused and a little bit just wanting maybe some clarification. It said that there was, um, there was a, on hold for a, a while in 2019, but now I guess Maybe um, you could just give me a, a sense about um, is it is back on now like a rush right? Um, but it seemed like that that also the Enbridge stock dropped when there was on on hold. So that's an exciting thing if we can just get the money. Um, sometimes that's all they listen to right is the fact that they're going to lose money. Um, but maybe um, just a little bit more clarification about what actually which permits are coming and. I'm a little confused still. <laughs> the, the proposal, I'll talk a little bit about that. The proposal by Enbridge for a line three replacement is a seven year old event. It began seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And so th uh, these permit requests and, and citing uh, was a big holdup because uh, the Leech Lake tribe refused to allow them to come through the reservation. Initially, the Fond du Lac reservation refused to let them through. And uh, uh, correct me if the number is wrong, uh, uh, Tanya, but I think it was like a $148 million settlement with the Fond du Lac tried, tribe allowed Enbridge to continue their oil through, through several, three or four other pipelines through the reservation with the contingency that Enbridge would, for the first time, take out the old pipe line three through the reservation. But... Uh, no, excuse me, Leech Lake did a settlement as long as the line was rerouted outside of their reservation. The Fond du Lac reservation allowed the replacement of line three on the reservation as long as Enbridge took the old line out. The final permit that needed to be issued was by the uh, United States Army Corps of Engineers, which is your 404 permits, which are water crossing and wetland permits which were granted in December of last year. At that particular point, Enbridge had already ma massively stored pipes uh, for the last five years on various sites in Northern Minnesota. 
anything that they could do before the need for a particular permit was put in place so that on December 2nd or 3rd when that Army Corps of Engineer permit was granted, Enbridge announced that they're going to bring 4,200 workers in northern Minnesota to, in order to put the piping in. I last read that Enbridge was saying they had as many as 5,000 workers in northern Minnesota, which is about five times more workers than you would have on any pipeline. You cannot get a pipeline worker in the United States, even though by some of the reactions to the opposition to the line, you'd think that everyone in the world was a pipeline worker. They are all in Northern Minnesota, Louisiana, uh, Pennsylvania, Texas, California, you will find 95% of all license plates operating in that region are from out of state. Uh, Enbridge has purchased them all in an urgent attempt to get as much piping in now so that when they go to court on March 23rd, they'll argue before the judge saying, we've done a half a billion dollars worth of work on this pipeline, and you're going to make us take it out now, Your Honor? Come on. So I, I think that's one of the angles that they're looking for. Uh, it is one of the last projects that is still surviving that's being proposed by Enbridge. And so there's a lot at stake in regards to stock owners equity. Enbridge their stock has dropped significantly in the last 10 years. If you look at their stock uh, range, if you invested $100,000 10 years ago, it might be worth uh, 75 or 80. It fluctuates. It went down uh, while line three was stalled. When the permit was issued, it went back up. But what the oil industry has done in general in order to survive the last couple of years is to spend all of their cash flow provided by stock investors. And so for example, if I owned $100,000 worth of Enbridge stock, Enbridge pays the highest dividend per capita of any oil transportation corporation in the world. And there's a reason for that because if you can guarantee the stock dividend, you will, and, and, and that's the kind of market you're in, uh, a portfolio that generates revenue rather than plays the stock market, they maintain their stock investors by paying a good, huge dividend back on a regular basis, even if the uh, value of the stock has uh, been driven down. And Enbridge has three or four different corporate entities. They have everything broken up so that if there's another spill like Kalamazoo, that only one particular LLC is responsible for it. And uh, the citizens of the United States pick up the cleanup costs for everything else. Line five and some of these other lines are simply shortcuts to get their oil to foreign markets. Line five takes oil from Canada back into Canada at Sarnia, Ontario, Canada. Uh, the Dakota Access was an attempt to get their oil flowing as is Keystone XL to flowing to uh, Texas market so it can be sold to a foreign market. Very little of any of the product that comes through Enbridge pipelines, generally speaking, uh, stays in the United States, even though um, if you believe what they've said and Enbridge spends a, a over $50 million a year on public relations in the United States and Canada the last five or six years, at least they have. Every single newspaper in Northern Wisconsin has a half page ad in every single issue, Super Bowl ads, uh, on and on and on. Uh, if you want some candy right now, ask Enbridge, they'll fund you. They've hired more American Indians than ever before. We're very proud in helping force Enbridge to do that. And uh, we've caused Enbridge to hire a lot of native contractors, which we're very proud of. And every single day that this line is slowed down is another day that a union worker can take home another daily daily's worth of wage to his family to feed his family. Because rather than being a <clears throat> nine month product, a pro project, it may be a 18 month project. It may be a project in which they put half of it in and then are ordered to take the other half out so they have a full project as well. So there shouldn't be any arguments from the workers who are earning time and a half and overtime working on Saturdays, the incident that someone talked about uh, last Saturday where this uh, caterpillar went into uh, the water and the man was trapped. I was on a Saturday evening uh, after somewhere around five o'clock as the sun went down. So they're working their workers really, really hard with the idea that they wanna get this thing in. 
Leduc uh, mentioned one small uh, victory, and that was the victory in which, uh, and, and this is how Enbridge operates in a lot of places in a way, you wanna watch this. Uh, they were proposing to start their drilling under I think 22 or more uh, water crossings, major water crossings like the Mississippi River. You remember the Mississippi River ends up in New Orleans, so it's upper watershed and any oil spill is, going to have an impact all the way down that line in some way, form, or fashion. Um, but uh, yeah, I lost my track of <laughs> thought for a minute there. Uh, they're small rushing victory, to get... The small victory? That, Pardon? You know, the small victory that... Um... Oh, the small victory was is that someone, uh, Enbridge, was going to try to start drilling under the Mississippi River or some other water crossing, and someone says, according to your engineer safety plan, you have to have a monitor on the river uh, river sides watching for potential air bubbles or cloudation uh, during the drilling process. Uh, the, air, the air bubbles would be from the pressure fight drilling action going underneath the riverbed and uh, the clouds would be caused by an intersection of the pipeline drilling with an aquifer that feeds into that river. Their safety proposal was to have monitors on each side of the lake watching for coloration or bubbles and someone had dare ask but how do you do that when ice is on the river and so Enbridge had to ask for a variance and they were denied of that because they says how are you gonna according to your safety plan here's what it is but you're not going to be able to do that until ice is out so until the ice is out there's no uh, drilling going to take place on the pads even though they're still continuing to construct them they've turned around and fo focused on laying as much pipe as they can so that was a short tirade. <laughs> Miigwech, Paul. I just wanted to say hi. I met you several times during 2013. I was up in the Pinocchio Hills over the fight. Um, I'm not sure that's completely done and over with either. But anyway, I just want to thank you for all the hard work you're doing regarding Mother Earth. Thank Nobody you. knows better than Native Americans about the Earth. We white people don't know anything. Well, I, I think you know something, and I think that if you reach down into your uh, your indigenous pagan roots from Europe, you might feel a little bit of it as well. Maybe that's why you're here. Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, I've had some, some of my relatives are Native Americans too, so. <laughs> no, we, we appreciate the fact that everyone's here. There's lots of people who uh, understand this argument about clean water as there's less clean water everywhere on the earth. And as we face this uh, cascading crisis is, more and more people are online. And as Leduc said, this is an industry that's an old industry. It's a failing industry. It's a infrastructure that's crumbling. It's not just line three or line four, which now needs to be replaced on the Fond du Lac reservation because it's popped out of its uh, wetlands. You can actually walk on it. It's not line five, which is causing problems at the Mackinac Straits or the Bad River Reservation. It's not line 6A, which is as integrity digs on the Lacouterie Reservation. It's not line seven, which blew up in Michigan. It's the entire aging infrastructure. They're driving around, you know, a 1950 model car that's been painted up and cleaned up, but the internal structure of the whole thing is uh, falling apart and decaying. And that's why, uh, you know, as Leduc said, there hasn't been a spill on line three, even though there's been spill on some of the other lines. It's the reason Leech Lake absolutely refused to have any more pipelines go through the reservation, the number of spills that their community has had to deal with. And so uh, again, when you look at the aging structure and then you look at the impact of the fossil fuel industry, you conclude that we need to do something different. And this is the line drawn in the sand. I wanted to ask a question. Um, folks may, hopefully folks know that we have line 61 here running right, right nearby. And they're talking about, they were talking about building an additional line paralleling that. And they recently expanded the flow of that dramatically. Um, can you elaborate more on how this might, line three is likely to impact Wisconsin? Well, the number one, it's the, the impact of, of line three not being rebuilt and, and uh, forcing itself to be decommissioned at some particular point is that it's everyone else is down pipe. It, it means that there's less of a reliance on line five. It means there are less of a reliance on the need to put a new line in, even though I saw some major discussion the other day that said there was issues over... Uh, taking that easement from 80 feet to 120 
there were so many property owners that refused to consent to it that uh, while Enbridge has been doing that a little bit at a time that it didn't seem to be a major uh, a major structural project. But Enbridge tends to be several years ahead of everybody in regards to what's going on. What, what I do know is, is that uh, it might be line 13, I have to look at my grid. Line 13 runs dual north and that Enbridge had requested federal commission to reverse that line. It's a smaller line uh, that runs the dilutant that goes into the bitumous, whatever tar sands, peanut butter, thick stuff to thin it out, which makes it so dangerous to transport uh, in pipes or trucks by rail. Uh, was in order to thin it through, and you're correct in saying that the uh, line 61 was highly pressurized so they could get more oil through that. But I did read that line 61 is currently running at only its 75% capacity. And so that it's possible that they could reroute that oil. Um, again, I have a request in and for some pipeline engineering questions. But you, you, you have to realize that in these pipes, there are numerous different types of oil and chemical flows through them. They're not blended, so you can't take tar sands and blend it into a, a medium crude and flow it through there, but, but they end up putting plugs in them and some kind of a cleansing system and plugs that go through. And so they batch oil of different kinds. So you might have medium crude flowing through in the morning, you might have heavy crude in the afternoon and those kinds of oil. Uh, in, in fact, there are flows through the, of, of certain chemicals through those pipelines that you'll never hear about because of security issues and Enbridge uh, can report them to the federal government, but you'll never see them, the information in public. So we know that there's different configurations of oil, oil flows. We know they can flow in different directions. The northern pipeline that's been requested by en Enbridge to be turned around could be used to flow some of that down. Enbridge is facing the potential shutdown of line five. That means that the twin to 61, which is 66, might be revived. But it, right at the moment, it seems to me to be more like three to four or five years away just from knowing how the pipeline permitting process uh, takes place. And so um, the impact of shutting down line three means the people who are concerned about line twin line 66 ought to be less. The people that are finding line five should be supporting because everybody else is down pipe and the shutdown of those particular products are tar sand products. That is the primary goal of the shutting down of line three is to prevent that tar sands oil from coming down from a foreign country through the United States. And if that happens, then we can focus on maybe the next worst type of oil production and that's fracking. But right, and it, it's not like shutting down tar sands is gonna prevent anyone from frying their eggs and going hungry. Uh, the Upper Peninsula has only been served by Enbridge for about 10 years in terms of propane fuel. Otherwise, it was uh, brought in by other ways. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, what we learned, those of us who have been keeping an eye on this issue, is there's a, the pipe is crossing um, the Rock River around uh, Fort Atkinson. And if where that were to go into the Rock River, uh, goodbye, Janesville. I mean, it would be devastation. So you know, something to keep in mind. So this whole issue isn't some issue far away. It's an issue that directly impacts us. I just want to, like, add, I would like to add that the Enbridge says they have this safety system. It's called the pig. It's a pig <laughs> system. Now with this pig system, they send a camera down through the pipeline to uh, see if there's any anomalies. I said, oh, okay, great. How often are you guys going to run this uh, pig system? Are you guys going to do it once a week? No, 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 no. We Are you going to do that once a month? No, 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 no. We can't do that. How often are you going to run this pig safety system? Once a year to check for <laughs> any anomalies or anything like that. That's what they told me. Outrageous. It is outrageous. And I, and I think uh, Enbridge has this uh, history of, of, ex of this kind of an experience, you know, when uh, the local fire chief at the Lacoudre Reservation inquired of Enbridge and says, what happens if there's an emergency or a leak on the reservation or a fire or anything like that, what should we do? 
and Enbridge folks basically said, just wait for us to arrive. We're only about an hour and a half to two hours away in Superior, Wisconsin with the emergency equipment you'll need to fight that fire or that spill. Um, the other thing is, is that a majority of the spills that are found have been found by human beings walking in the woods in the line over the years on the Bad River Reservation. A hunter uh, walking on Denemy Creek discovered that uh, the pipeline had allowed Denemy Creek to create a new waterway by di diverting itself on that pipeline uh, easement that had been disturbed and it created a whole new uh, a uh, whole new uh, structure to Denemy Creek and it diverted it around. And when this, uh, this hunter came upon the pipeline, it was uh, hanging along the edge of the easement in the air for about a hundred feet. And uh, so that guy came out of the woods and told someone at Bad River and they called Enbridge and Enbridge checked it out and said, sure, sure is, it sure is darn washed out and hanging. So mo a majority of the spills are, are Pretty much found by people in the woods, and as uh, Tanya had said earlier, there are there's never 100% pressure in the pipeline. According to the pipeline industry, it's always less than 100%, which means a line is always leaking to some extent, even if it's a tiny pin leak or or loss. Thanks. Um, I I want to point out we don't have too much time left, um, and I know that this is the hundred dollar if you're. I don't know, maybe that's not the best expression, but the important question, I think, for a lot of us who want to help out is kind of what we can do. Now, I know there, you know, we could contact our elected officials is certainly one of them. I was curious how Tammy Baldwin, I think we can all agree that Ron Johnson's a lost cause. I mean, it might, you could still contact him. Uh, how's Tammy Baldwin on the issue? Does anyone know? No, I, I don't know what uh, her position is, but I would encourage people to uh, send letters to the go uh, Governor Evers. Uh, he's got this whole cl uh, global climate warming initiative that's going on. They've held hearings and everything. Um, make sure that letters uh, go, th uh, go to him and that committee uh, contacting the Minnesota governor, uh, Waltz, uh, at this particular time to put pressure on him to move in some way. Uh, complimenting the governor of Michigan for ordering line five to shut down. Um, there's a huge divestment. There's a loan actually coming up that Enbridge is, uh, has a 2.2 billion loan uh, from all the banks that we typically uh, know, Sitco and uh, Wells Fargo, that's uh, being renewed on March 22nd, I believe. And so there's an effort by 350.org and some of the other organizations to begin uh, going to stockholder meetings and impacting stockholders and, and, and talking to the banks and, and encouraging them to do what many, many other banks. There are banks that have pulled billions of dollars of investment equity out of fossil fuel projects and said they're not going to fund anymore. The Rockefeller family says they're not going to fund anymore. Uh, there are car automobile makers who say they're not going to make gas cars anymore. It's Enbridge and some of these other organizations that uh, that continue to think that the fossil fuel industry is something that they ought to look at. Uh, I, I see that uh, Sinead just put up a link uh, in regards to that uh, de-investment campaign. Uh, and then I always say that people need to do what they do best. I mean, if you're a photographer and, and can feel safe, uh, the camps are COVID safe. We've really worked hard to make sure that uh, all the camps uh, are abided by in terms of uh, protocol and, and uh, we're recording people that are getting their tests and so forth, making sure. Um, there's lots of winter activities in Northern Minnesota. There's lots of skiing. It's, if you like cold, it's, <laughs> go there. Uh, snowshoeing, there's winter sports and there is lodging in the big cities over a lot of the lodging for the small uh, cities is taken by contractors. There's plenty uh, around the areas that you can go to. Go you know, go check the, it out. I mean, you can follow that pipeline along Highway 2 for quite a ways and see the destructive nature of it and, and find it, find the path as it goes along. Uh, see for yourself, uh, make connections with your church groups. If you're, uh, 
you know, I was up there. There was a bunch of singing grannies that were up there from a church group. There's been Quakers from Pennsylvania that have showed up there. And basically what they've did is connected with the local groups and their local churches to see who's hosting uh, people so they can stay safe and find places like multiple lodging places that hold uh, five to a dozen people that as they travel in caravans. Um, uh, see what's going on, uh, but enjoy northern Minnesota and stay safe. But uh, go there if you're a photographer. Go there if you're a cross-country skier. Uh, and uh, as we uh, as things open up, uh, we we encourage you to get up there. Uh, you know, if you're a cook, uh, send good recipes to uh, the uh, water protectors' uh, location so they can alternate their uh, recipes. Um, I've always said that what people can do best is what they already do, just do it better and do it in conjunction with the opposition. If you write letters, if you write poetry, if you draw, if you, you know, take, take photos, get up there and take photos of the destruction. So, or at least getting photos for historical. It may not be as exciting, but I imagine they take money too, right? Um, well, they absolutely, yeah. And, and all of the, you know, stop, Line3.org has modules, Honor the Earth has modules. Uh, there are legal fees in regards to the court cases that are going on that are, are horrendous costs. Uh, I don't know if people can offer legal legalese uh, advice, uh, but yes, uh, money is probably the best thing you can do because it's like having a fire and sending a request out to replace your mattress and the next day you have four of them in your yard when you only need one. Um, there's plenty of food uh, right at the moment in a lot of ways, but I would check with uh, to 350.org and some of these other organizations to see what they need, uh, yurts and, and uh, heating supplies and some clothing were in demand at a point there, but you know all the food that was coming up there, uh, there wasn't enough room to store a lot of it uh, in, in some of the facilities that are at the camp. And so it ends up freezing and, and uh, those kinds of things. That's great. Um, any more Daniel. questions or comments? Comment, comment. Um, if anyone it. has any empty trailers, empty trailers that we can convert into tiny houses, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> We've been looking for trailers to be able to make tiny houses uh, that we can use on the um, on the front lines over here at the different camps. And once, uh, once this is all said and done for, we can uh, donate them to homeless shelters or homeless areas. Right, and, when, when, and if you contact people in front of going up there and have a chance, um, there's a lot of uh, curriculum uh, kind of uh, things going on uh, in, in the camp because we are nonprofits. And so there's, you know, we're talking about doing archaeological work. We're talking about tapping trees. We're talking about drone flying. We're talking about archaeological study stuff, which we could uh, use some help on. We just think the Enbridge one was insufficient and there's things that we can share to people. So uh, first of all, you know, uh, there is a sign up sheet, a resource sheet at uh, that stop line3.org a site where you can contact people and say here's what we have and if something is needed uh, there will be people who pay attention and get back to you and say yes we could use this um, or no we can't use that right at the moment kind of a thing so make sure you know what you're doing and self-sufficient you know earlier in the year we had a bunch of people from the cities show up on a day they left when it was 34 degrees and it was two degrees or something or you know 18 degrees in northern minnesota and they weren't dressed properly safety self-sufficiency is so important so that uh, you don't end up uh, taking resources that aren't needed, you know, and if you're going to go up there and get arrested, let your mom know kind of a thing so that <laughs> you, you can contact Hey, her. we're Wisconsinites. We can handle it. <laughs> a lot of people have been coming from Wisconsin. And if you email, you know, if you go to that Welcome Water Protectors uh, website that I put in there, there's an email, welcomewaterprotectors at gmail.com. And you can email that if, you, if you're thinking about coming. Uh, share a little bit of your plans about when you're when you're planning to come and um, we can try to help as much as possible but being self-sufficient eases the burden um, but you know one of the reasons to be here is that I think it's one thing to watch you know from your Facebook feed or to watch the live streams but to be here and be present and be in proximity to that destruction and really see it and understand it from the point of view of being on the ground and then also to be in these camps is to be in a space of healing and a space of real care 
and community building. And we want people to witness that too, to understand that that's what we're doing here. Um, and then you can go and tell about that in all the ways that you do in your own communities and that helps to build the movement. So if you can get here, we would love to see you here. Thanks guys. I, I don't know how many of us, uh, especially of us gray heads, uh, have the energy to head up there, but we're definitely with you in spirit and uh, we support the cause and, and we're going to do what we can to try to help you out. So we much appreciate you coming here. Um, Charles, I, I can tell you that there was, a, a, according to Winona LaDuke's narrative, there was a whole caravan of gray haired <laughs> ladies driving Priuses up there when <laughs> uh, so gray hair is not out of the question. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> okay, well I any final comments from those who haven't spoken? I don't want to take too much longer, but if someone wants to chime in now, now is your opportunity. Chuck. Who's Joe. That? Joe. Hey, Joe. Oh, yeah. I got one. It uh, goes back to uh, what's the name when she was talking about the pig going through the pipeline once a year. I'm going to go back a little bit. These uh, old pipelines, anybody know what the engineering specs are? The pressure ratings? So let's say way back they had the old pipeline design and they're going to pump through X amount of oil at such and such pressure. So the welding in the early, early times is much different than welding today, the techniques. So how much overpressure do these pipelines take? What is their design? What's their ceiling? Uh, everything that, has to- I'm yeah, not sure we have time for that, Joe. It's, it's, it's an engineering short answer. Question. It's an engineering question, but <laughs> I can tell you that there are pipeline uh, outfitters who worked on these pipes who are horrified at, at the whole idea. There was no EPA when these lines were put in, and you're right about welding, you're right about insulative factors and all that, but that's why uh, at, on the Lacoudere Reservation, they've had uh, three or four different integrity digs, digs on those lines coming through because almost all the integrity digs have been in wetlands. And it's because there's an outer coating that has come loose on those seals. And that's where they're seeing most of their deterioration along those welds. So you're, you're correct in asking questions about it, but it's a big engineering question about pressure and, and uh, what kind of pipes yeah, my worry is how many wild rice uh, areas were destroyed. Um, I've been up in northern Minnesota in previous jobs in those rice fields. Oh, man, they're just something. And that wild rice up there, oh, the menus, oh, man, fantastic. It, well, it's it's a livelihood. It's an economic livelihood for many Ojibwe people, and it's a food sustenance. It's a staple. I eat wild rice a couple times a week uh, in, in my meals or for breakfast or with my chicken soup or whatever it might be. It's the main staple rather than uh, macaroni kind of stuff. So um, I don't know if Tanya had any figures on that. She noted how many lakes had been already destroyed uh, but it's the greatest fear of the Bad River when it comes to Line 5 that that line will destroy 30 to 40,000 pounds of wild rice on the Cockhagen Sloughs alone if there should be a leak into the Bad River and into Lake Superior. Uh, but, you know, you go to northern Minnesota and you're right, uh, the wild rice uh, refuge and some of these other lakes are tremendous producers uh, of wild rice and food for the area. And, and this is why the Abid family uh, out of Sandy Lake in that whole area, who rice numerous lakes in that area. And it's not just rice, it's, it's, it's medicines, it's uh, pharmaceutical stuff out of the woods. It's, uh, it's products that are used in household products. It's, a, it's, it's some of the 4,000 species that were named in the, uh, the Wisconsin Ojibwe Voigt case when when the Ojibwe are asked to name the plants they used in the woods they came back with a list of 4,000 in the DNR 
and state negotiator says, "Why well, it's almost every single plant that grows in northern Wisconsin. And they says, yeah, that's that's right. It's our pharmacy. It's our lumber yard. It's our grocery store. It's our part of our life. And that's why you see indigenous people fighting so hard to pry to preserve what's left of that life. Yeah, I want to try very complex because it's a whole economy. It's a whole different economy and it's, it's a very valuable economy. Okay, folks. Well, I think that's actually a really good place to end. Um, something to think about, leave us to think about. And uh, so once more, I, I really want to thank our speakers for, for educating us and informing us and inspiring us. So thanks guys. And uh, I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Great. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Bye bye. Miigwech. Bye. Bye. Miigwech. 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 Mi